I was a passenger on a private jet at 28 years old. It was like when I walked into that airplane, it was like the scene in The Wizard of Oz when everything goes from black and white to color. Yeah. I was like, people in, live like this? Like, yeah. what yeah. is this? It's pretty nutty. And I'm like, I want to fly like this. You're like, how do I do it? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia, and wishing you a very happy new year. Yes, 2021 is here. 2020, what a year in the rearview mirror. Not that everything that started with us in 2020 has left our lives. Certainly, COVID is still around. There's reason to be hopeful, still plenty of reason to be concerned. But it's a nice time. You know, this new year time is a an appropriate time to think about what we want out of our lives over the next year, despite the circumstances we find ourselves in, either personally or on a macro societal basis. And I've got a great guest along those lines. His name is Jesse Itzler. He is a former rap musician turned entrepreneur turned fitness and performance guru. He's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Living with a Seal. He's also a friend here in town and a fellow dad. And we talk a lot about getting the most out of our days and what he's learned about money through his uh, collection of successes and failures over the past few decades. He's a very interesting dude, and I know you'll enjoy the conversation. So it's a new year, folks. You know, I hope you had restful holidays. I hope you took the time to spend meaningful time with friends and relatives and focus on what's good in life. Stacy and I had a wonderful time with our two kids. We spent two weeks in Kenya. We moved the safari up on the bucket list. After interviewing Bill Perkins a few months ago, the author of the book, Die With Zero, I just couldn't get this notion out of my head that, you know, all of us, no matter we have a little or a lot, should plan to use our money in a way that it maximizes the return we get out of life. And one of the lessons in his book isn't just like, hey, don't just have a bucket list for your entire life. Have a bucket list over a certain period of time. Like if your kids are only going to be with you until they're 18 or 20 or whatever it is, you need to plan on doing things with them while they're still around and open to those experiences. And so Stacy front-loaded the safari experience with our two kids, and it was spectacular. And the people of Kenya were fantastic. Of course, COVID was never far from our minds, but Kenya has a very strict policy where everybody flying into the country has to demonstrate, has to present a negative COVID test that is no more than 96 hours old. So it was a little weird. But it was also kind of like cool to be in a place where they took it very seriously. I mean, people walking down the street in Nairobi with nobody anywhere close to them were wearing masks everywhere we went. We wore masks everywhere, except when we were out driving around on safari in open air vehicles with some uh, proper social distance. It was a really fun time. I'm going to include photos from our trip in the Crazy Money Listeners group on Facebook. More about that in a second. As is appropriate at the turn of a new year, I just want to look back on 2020 and tell you all how grateful I am for your support of the podcast. I've been at it for almost two years now, and we've had just incredible growth. We've had incredible success in landing guests who are of just absolute top-notch quality. Overall, 2020 was a pretty bizarre year, but it was very positive for the podcast. We tripled the audience over 46 episodes that included amazing guests like winners of the Heisman Trophy, the PGA Championship, and eight Olympic gold medals. Thank you, Apollo Ono. Amazing authors and journalists like Jonathan Rausch, Lori Gottlieb, Paul Sullivan, Lisa Bernbach of the Preppy Handbook, that is, Morgan Housel, Guy Raz, Barry Schwartz of the Paradox of Choice, and Janie Scott, and many, many more. More importantly, to me anyway, is that this podcast has been a vehicle to help me keep in touch with a lot of old friends and to make a bunch of new ones in the process. And so I just want to say thank you to all our guests who've lent their time to this discussion about the connection between money and happiness and to all of you listeners for making time to allow me into your ears. 2021, I'm so excited. It's going to be a great year. I've got a lot of great things planned. Already have a lot of very good interviews in the can, as they say, that we'll be releasing over the next few weeks. Some scheduled ones that are coming up, including with the former CEO of a major global corporation, top authors and thinkers, a mega pastor, a Maasai warrior that we met on safari, who will tell us about the dowry he and his family paid in cows and sheep for both of his wives. That'll be a popular episode with certain segments of the audience. I also have a 100th episode anniversary guest lined up who is going to blow 
your mind. I am ridiculously excited about that interview coming up, and you'll just have to wait and see. The place you'll find out about these kinds of things is on the Crazy Money Listeners group on Facebook, the aforementioned Crazy Money Listeners group on Facebook. And I want to say hello to some new folks who signed up for that in the last week or so, including Rich Schmidt, Mike Weaver from the launch.com days, Kim McCormick, hello, Beth Diefenbacher, also hello, Michael Lua, Greg Mara, Bobby Mandel, and Brennan, Bill Anderson, Peter Contini, Dr. Eleanor Douglas, thank you for the negative COVID test that got us into Kenya, Brandon Johnson, Rose Agatone, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Ms. Agatone, Chad Schultz, the handsome man of Nashville, Sean Sullivan, Sean, do you realize the responsibility That's in reference to something his mother said to him in high school. Sean will laugh about that in private. Tim Krozak, aware of the Purple Fleece. Jeremy Sipos, Sipos, Aaron Calloway, A.A. Ron Calloway, J.B. Brown, Catherine Lane Burns, Leo Gonzalez, Jackie Green, Molly Fuller, and New Hampshire's own Danny Mulkin. Hey, Danny. What's up, buddy? I also want to say thanks to Phil Zellnar, Bill Chin, and Carpe Diem Jim. Don't know know your full name, but sound like my kind of guy. Thanks for reaching out on... Paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. So if you want to say hello, if you have guest suggestions or complaints, send me a note at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Let's talk about Jesse Itzler. Jesse is one of the most unique dudes I've ever met. He plays the game of life by his own rules, and he is one, perhaps the most purposeful person I know, in the sense that he is He is doing everything he can to get the most out of life on his terms. He only eats fruit until noon and has been doing so for decades. He has a background in the music world and yet is also a very accomplished entrepreneur and innovator and author and motivator. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Living with a Seal. He co-founded Marquee Jets the world's largest private jet card company, which he and his partner sold to Berkshire Hathaway NetJets. Jesse then partnered with Zico Coconut Water, which he and his partner sold to the Coca-Cola company. He's a former rapper on MTV and wrote and performed the NBA's Emmy Award-winning I Love This Game music campaign and the popular New York Knicks anthem, Go New York Go. You'll hear him talk all about these jingles as the way he made his living until he got his big break. When he's not running ultra marathons, eating vegan food, or being a dad to his four kids, Jesse can be found at the NBA's Atlanta Hawks games where he's an owner of the team. He is married to Spanx founder, Sarah Blakely. Hello, Sarah. Hope you're doing great. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conversation with Mr. Jesse Itzler. Jesse Itzler, welcome to Crazy Money. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So you're just asking me a question. Have I ever forgotten to press record? Yeah. Not in an interview, not for more than like 30 seconds but I know it's coming, (laughs) you know, and I know what it's going to come when I'm busiest, when it's the most important interview I've ever had and when I'm not focused and it's going to be the most insightful, brilliant conversation. And then I'm going to realize it's inevitable. Paul. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. It's going to happen. We should take up some kind of insurance policy. Can I put some kind of money (laughs) down now? So before we jump into all my questions, Jesse, I just tell the listeners that we are in your home in Atlanta, Georgia. We just walked out of your amazing office and there's a lot of cool stuff that you have here, but I got to tell you, the only thing you have that I really covet is your eight foot by 20 foot whiteboard (laughs) in your office. When's your birthday, Paul? I'm like, maybe I'll get that for you. It's not a matter of, I mean, there's just no place to put it. You think Stacy would, (laughs) honey, No. the only place to put it would like be in our bedroom. And I'd have to move my Taylor Swift poster. (laughs) It's one of the best investments I've made. I use it all the time. What do you do on that whiteboard? I mean, there's so much stuff you got going on. I keep my daily schedule on that whiteboard. So I write out my whole week. So I have a great kind of week at a glance thing. Mm -hmm. I get everything out of my head and put it on that whiteboard. I draw Mickey Mouse pictures on the whiteboard and doodle sometimes. But it's, no, I'm a visual person. So for me, having something in my office that I can kind of lay out my thoughts is super helpful. When does an idea get erased off the whiteboard as, eh, it's not a good idea? Nothing gets erased off the whiteboard without me taking a screenshot on my phone. Literally nothing. Right. So, because sometimes I'll go back and be like, I had this idea, it was a terrible idea, but then all of a sudden it might be a good idea and I don't remember it. So usually I'll fill up the whiteboard and then I'll take a screenshot mm-hmm. and then I'll wipe it down. What's the best idea that's ever made it to that whiteboard? I just brought it to fruition Literally, as we speak, it's a calendar. It's a planning system called the Big Ass Calendar Club. 
Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that's the best, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. But it started out as an idea and said, I mean, how would this work? And you start to connect the dots and all the way to fruition. What is the purpose of the Big Ass Calendar? Well, it was born out of me mapping out my year. So mm-hmm. I realized that my years were, as I've gotten older, becoming surprisingly way more complicated and with kids and everything else. And my calendar was filling up with other people's requests for my time. Weddings, Zoom meetings, lunch appointments. Podcast interviews. <laughs> well, I was getting zapped of the things I loved. I had no time really left in the day to do things that I wanted to do. And sometimes I would not have the time to work out or whatever. And I just said, you know what? I want to outline my entire year in advance. What do I want to do this year? What trips do I want to take? What one-on-one stuff with my kids? I put it all down on a board, on the whiteboard. And that process actually evolved. And it took me a while, but it evolved into a business where I was then telling other people, you know, this is my system. I've invested a lot in it and it's teachable and Mm -hmm. it works. And it evolved into this kind of coaching program. It has a big calendar with it. What kind of things did you make possible this year by thinking about your life as a full year that thinking about it week by week wouldn't have made space for? I love this because I don't have to think about it. I know the answer right away. Date nights, Mm -hmm. which became super consistent because we scheduled it. Family dinners. I think we went from maybe 40 family dinners in 20. 19 to 320 family dinners. There was something else that contributed there, there to that was, in 2020. <laughs> there was, there was. But even with COVID and everything else, it's easy to get caught up in you know, working and not prioritizing. So even before that, we were on track. And right. we made it a priority before, but you're right, that definitely helped. But it'll continue into 2021 and 2022, become a highlight. All my races were mapped out, all my trips, college reunion you know, with my friends, Really, I just wrote down everything that I would love to do and I scheduled it first and scheduled my meetings around them instead of the other way around. You know, I've listened to a lot of the stuff you've talked about over the last few years and I've done your introduction separately so people kind of, you know, understand your resume. But as I've heard you talk recently the last few years, it seems you've got a growing sense, if not of your own mortality, then certainly of the people that you love. Is that an imperative in creating the big ass calendar and making the most of the time that you have left. The girl that I went to my prom with in high school died this week. I went to my prom with her and then a year later, her prom, she was a year younger than me Mm -hmm. with her. And she had a massive heart attack. She died five days ago and I'm not singling her out, but I'm sure a lot of people in the same boat and maybe Sue herself might've said, well, I'm going to start to make changes in the new year. I'm going to start next year. I'm going to start after this. And a lot of people don't get that chance, you know, and we put stuff off. So the answer to your question is yes, it's created tremendous urgency in my life. Like if I have a chance to create a memory or an opportunity, I take it. I really live by these rules, a trip, whatever. So, you know, we all know we're going to die. Everybody knows they're going (laughs) to die, but do you have your graveyard plot picked out? No, nope. burn me up and sprinkle me over the food court at Perimeter Mall. You're that's, going that route? That's where we're going to go, yeah. But my point is that most people don't think it's going to happen soon. Right. They know they're going to die, but they don't think it's really on the horizon right now or anytime soon. And at any given day, we can turn the corner and a Mack truck smacks into us. We just don't know. So that thought process, I think, is really important, at least for me, in creating urgency around doing stuff, man. I don't like put stuff off like I'm going to do that. Well, that's for my 60s. It's like, right. if I may, I remember when I was signed to a record label called Delicious Vinyl. Yep. And I'm sorry to do this to you, Young, but Young MC wrote Bust a Move, mm-hmm. was working on his second album, and they're sitting in the studio, and Young is going through his songs to the producers, Mike and Matt. They're like, this is great. That should be the first single. He's like, no, that's going on. My, I got to save that for my third album. No, that's going on. This one's a, that's my first single on my fourth album. This one's going on my fifth album. Right. And guess what? He didn't have a third album. album, No, there was no third album. (laughs) Right, right. Go all in all the time and, you know, hope the well never runs out. Yeah, no doubt. All right, let's go back in time. You're 14 years old. Where were you living and what music were you listening to? At 14 years old, it was 1982. I was living in Long Island where I grew up in Roslyn. And I was listening to a combination of, well, rap was starting to emerge. I was just starting to listen to hip hop. Like Curtis Blow, The Breaks. I don't know if that was 82, but right around there. Yeah. 
I was listening to hip hop. What did your parents do for work? My dad owned the plumbing supply house and my mom at first was a teacher and then she was a stay at home mom. What did you pick up about money from your folks? My parents never talked about money. I still can't understand how four kids went to college from my house, but they did. They never like emphasized it. They really were into experiences, family stuff. We played a lot of board games. Like our entertainment was board games, storytelling, family coming over, playing outside. You know, my birthday parties were all in my backyard. There was no, Mickey Mouse didn't show up. It was like my dad, you know, got a tire and we tried to throw a ball through a tire. And if we did, like he'd give us ice cream. Like that was my birthday. Yeah. They were never into material stuff. There was no artwork in my house. My dad never had a fancy watch. We all piled in a station wagon. So who was rich in your eyes? Like what was the minimum level? How did you define rich when you were a kid? You know, I grew up in a really wealthy town. My parents bought their house for $33,000 because they were the first of four homeowners and the community over time became super middle class. And I had a very interesting childhood, Paul. If you went to Roslyn, the four years ahead, I'd never really spoken about this. I'm glad you're making me think about it. From the day I was a freshman in high school and you went up four years. So for my senior year, the class, the sophomore, junior, and senior class when I was a freshman. And when I was a freshman, the junior, sophomore, freshman class. So eight-year window when I was in high school. We had multiple billionaires graduate. In the 80s. Yeah, that became multiple billionaires. Oh, they became billionaires. They became billionaires. Right, okay. We had, in my graduating class, I think we have, I had 200 kids in my class, four felons. We had white collar crime. <laughs> well, how many of those felons were billionaires? Parents were. All, <laughs> okay. Probably all four. We had multiple suicides. Bernie Madoff, the biggest Ponzi schemer ever is from my town. Mm-hmm. So there was incredible wealth and opportunity. At the same time, some people went to jail. Some people committed suicide. Some people waxed rich. And some people didn't. I've been trying to figure out, you know, like what happened to the people that went one way versus the people that went the other way in this one town. But my first exposure to really thinking about money, this is going to sound weird because I was older, but I remember this specifically. I was on a trip in Jamaica with five friends, six friends, and I was maybe 23 years old and it was December And my friend on Wall Street, one guy was a Wall Street broker. The guy on Wall Street was sitting in the ocean. He said, you're not going to believe this. I just got my bonus. And I'm like, you got your bonus? Like, what do you mean? He's like, I got my holiday bonus. Well, he's like, I'm f***ing rich. (laughs) And I'm like, what are you talking about? His actual name was Rich. I'm like, what are you talking about, Rich? And he said, I made $4 million in bonus money. And how old was he? He was 23 years old, 22 oh, oh years old. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, wait, I was like, I almost Four vomit. Million. I'm like, you, you couldn't get out of the parking lot. <laughs> you made $4 million <laughs> in bonus money. I've right. never met a millionaire mm-hmm. that was a friend of mine, my age, in my ever, in the history of my life. And I could not believe it. It was crazy. And it just freaked me out. Here's the other thing that freaked me out. The only friend similar to that that made a lot of money was making like $300,000 a year. And I asked him, I said, Scotty, what did you save? You make 300 grand. I made 35 grand until I was 26 years old. I'm like, he made 250 grand. I said, what did you save? He was like, save? Nothing. Yeah, he was like, what are you talking about? I'm 22. I live in Manhattan. Right. I'm paying, you know, half my money in rent. But I made 35 grand and I saved five grand. So I'm like, I'm richer than Scotty. Right. That was my first introduction to like people my age competing, making money, mm. you know, and like really redirecting my brain. The guy that made 4 million when he was 22 or 23, has he sustained that level of wealth? He hasn't worked in probably, it's an interesting story. He worked for a company called SAC Capital, Steve Cohn, hedge right, fund, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, became really good at what he did continued to go from four probably to 40, you know, yeah, yeah. and then stopped working, got prostate cancer and survived. So it's a wild, wild story. When you were 22 and you saw your buddy starting to make a lot of money, what were you thinking about your career? What was pulling you along and motivating you at the time? Well, when I was 22, the only thing I wanted to do is make a record. 
the only thing on my mind was getting a record deal, making a record, being in the music industry because I loved it. And that was really the only thing that was on my mind. When it came to money, I only had three goals. And I remember telling my friend, I was living on his couch in Burbank trying to shop a record deal. And I told him, I want three things. I want to make enough money that I could take a two-week vacation. If I could work my ass off for 50 weeks, but take two weeks off and do whatever I want, I'm in. Two, I want a swimming pool. I don't want to (laughs) swim in public swimming pools. And number three is I want to be able to grow my own fruit tree. I want to like be able to grow my own food. And by the way, not much has changed since that, right. since that moment. Right. But that is honest to God truth. That's, that was my goal. What kind of jobs were you doing? Like, how were you paying your bills while you were trying to become a recording artist? Well, the first thing I did is I eliminated all my bills. I slept on my friend's couches and I ate packaged canned foods pretty much. Not because I was like homeless, but just like I was budgeting. But, I had, but that seems to be a pretty self-aware thing to be doing because a lot of people would take the opposite route, which is to, you know, whatever, wait tables and whatever the 1989 equivalent of driving Uber was, take service jobs to try to make some money. And instead you went the, you know, limit my consumption as much as possible. And route. I was hunting for, rather than take the bartender job, I was in a creative world. I was in an eat what you kill environment. So I was looking for the bigger score. So I was in the music business. So if I could write a jingle for a company and make 1500 bucks, that would last me for five months. Yeah. And during those five months, I'd look for the next jingle. Builds your credibility at the same time. And that's all I was doing. I was going company to company, trying to find the jingle. Can I do this? And I did. I did a video for the World Wildlife Fund that paid me four grand. I did the Nick song, paid me four grand. I did a jingle, $2,500. Any odds and ends, thing like that as opposed to a day-to-day thing. So it kept me creatively in the mix. And it gave you an imperative to work. I mean, if you wanted to eat, you had to hustle. 100%. What I was doing at 22 is I was writing theme songs for professional sports teams on spec. So I would go in the studio, write them on spec, and then try to sell them. If I sold them, I would make the difference between the studio cost and the sale. And if I didn't, I was out of the money that it cost me to make the songs. Right. What were your folks advising this whole time? Were they just sort of not locking eyes with your career or did they tell you to go get a real job? They never questioned what I was doing. I mean, I never had a resume. All my friends were getting jobs, Wall Street, advertising agencies, et cetera. And I was out there trying to make music, but they were super encouraging. And you know what? Paul, I always knew that it was going to take me somewhere. I didn't know what, I didn't know how, but I never felt pressure that like, you know, it's not going to work out for me. I always had confidence that I could bob and weave. And, you know, some days there was doubt, but in the big picture and scheme of things, I felt like I would land on my feet. How'd you get your first break? You mentioned a few things. I mean, the Nick song came along, you got that going, but where was the first big professional break where you're like, this is going to work? The Nick song was the biggest thing because they were the best customer. I knew if I told people that the Knicks hired me, other people would hire me. But the second song, which were the Charlotte Hornets at the time, they've changed their name since, but the Charlotte Hornets hired me to do a song and that was real validation because it proved to me that I wasn't like a one hit thing. Like now I had a business, other teams are following suit. That was the most impactful moment for me. I really had validation. And then I did the, I love this game song for the NBA that went on to win an Emmy, a sports Emmy. And then that then the floodgates opened. How'd you get your contract at Delicious Vinyl? Well, I went to every single record label that I could get in the door or send a tape to in the early 90s, and I got rejected by all of them. And then I flew out to LA, and I was a big fan of this independent label called Delicious Vinyl because they had two artists that I loved, Tone Loke, Wild Thing and Funky Cold Medina, and Young MC, Bust a Move, and they were hot and cool, man. I loved the vibe. I cold called them. And I got up to the CEO's and founder's assistant, and I actually had a demo of an artist that I worked with in the studio that I kind of took from the studio, and I told them that I had this demo. I just confused the assistant. She, <laughs> she thought I was the artist whose demo I had, which is a guy named Dana Dane, who I knew that the founder loved. And she said to me, Dana, you know, Mike would love to meet with you. If you can come here for lunch, he's dying to meet you. So I showed up at the office as Dana Dane, told them I work with Dana and while we're waiting for Dana, you know, can I play my demo? And I played it and I got the deal. 
What did you learn from the music business that you've applied to your life as an entrepreneur and now as an author and a guru in the health and fitness space? And I mean that sincerely. I made a mistake when I signed my record deal. I took my foot off the gas because that was my goal. And what I should have done is step on the gas and made a better record and been in the studio and mastered my craft and been a better marketer and cared more. I celebrated instead of going to work and I got dropped from the label. And it was a powerful lesson in, you know, you got to play a 10 inning game, not a six inning game. You know, you got to go all the way through and more. And that was a big lesson. But the music industry in general, you know, it's interesting because artists start out, at least when I was an artist, you have to create everything, a name, a logo, you have to promote yourself, very little ways. There was no internet back then. And artists become amazing marketers, more than just talent in the songs that they produce, any kind of artist. It was a great crash course for me as a 22-year-old to go through the marketing process of this. I hated my name. I hated the image. The name was Jesse James with a Y. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I walked in there. I'm like, I didn't have a good rap name. It was like J-Rock or something. And the guy's (laughs) like, no, you should be Jesse James. And I'm like, I don't want to be Jesse James. He's like, well, I own the label. How about Jesse James Mellencamp? Right, right. (laughs) Does that feel better? I was like, you know, he's like, we just sold 5 million records for Tone Loke. You know, you're Jesse James. Right. I'm like, all right, you know, I'll trust you. And listening to managers instead of trusting my instinct, there were so many lessons that went on to help me, you know, and the first one was trusting my gut because a lot of things went against my gut instinct, listening to other people and it just didn't feel right. And, you know, even to this day, it's something I try to hone in on being in tune with my gut. But as a 22-year-old, when you're thrown into the mix, again, my parents had no input in this. My dad was like making plumbing fixtures. I was on my own. I came out of that fire way stronger. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the point about when you actually get what you're looking for, that's the time to put your foot on the gas. I had the experience when I worked at Facebook. I hit a number that I you know, couldn't even imagine when I was younger. And then I was like, oh, I guess I'm done. Let me just stop. And in so doing, that's an integral part of where this podcast came from many years later, was I found myself highly dissatisfied. I had taken myself out of the game unintentionally, and I realized, oh, wow, there's no real joy to be found when you're sitting on the sidelines. I mean, when you've got a strong hand, play it as hard as you can. Now, for your terms, right? didn't mean that I should have stayed in the digital media business and tried to be the CEO of whatever next company I could go to, but I mean, like, take that opportunity to invent yourself in the way you've always wanted to. I agree. And you know, because my dad never talked about money, he never prioritized making money. I think my relationship with money, it's different. Like I never felt like I went to work for money. Right. I always felt like I went to work because it's what I love to do. And maybe I would have made more money if I focused more on that. I don't know. But that's where I was at that time in my life. Well, let's run this down because you've never had a real job. Let's be honest. For a successful person, you pretty much have a series of being unemployed, a a series of resume bullets that say you're unemployed. You were a rap artist. You co-founded Marquee Jets. You were part of a partnership that sold Zico coconut water to Coca-Cola. You've written two books, one of which was a New York Times bestseller. You've run at least 200 mile races and you train relentless. You've won an Emmy. But none of these is an honorable job, Jesse. Let's be, let's be <laughs> honest about that. Anybody that's out for the money would probably have not done any of these things, right? They would have gone to Wall Street early and tried to stick around as long as possible. Yep. I've also blown through a lot of that money <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so besides your family, which of these accomplishments or whatever other accomplishments, which of these represents the person that you want to be? I think I'm a compilation of the result of all the things you just mentioned on there, including the failures, which you didn't mention, because there's a lot of Let's talk about those. I'm happy to. Before we do that, if I could just answer, I think what I'm most proud of on all that is the 100-mile race, because that was just a true testament of, like, will. Because you proved to yourself that you could do it? I proved to myself that I could do it. A lot of people didn't think I could do it, and it's an equal playing field. Business, people have advantages, They start with money, they can raise money, they have connections, they get lucky. You know, in a hundred mile race, you have to keep going. (laughs) It's just like, you can't hide. Right. I'm really proud of that. I did it twice. 
wants to do it and then wants to make sure at 50 I could do it again. The person I want to be is someone that has multiple experiences, multiple adventures. You know this, Paul, I always say it's my life resume, but someone that's just really like, is just battle tested, just scarred from all the stuff that they've done and been through it. And I feel like, you know, look, I've bootstrapped businesses. I've started with nothing. I've raised money. I've made people a ton of money. I've lost people money. You know, I've been through a lot, man, in 52 years of, I've never had a real job, but I've had those huge swings. I've taken right. big swings, man. What are the consistent themes for the wins and what are the consistent themes for the losses? The consistent themes for the, these are great questions. The consistent themes for the wins are being patient, obsessing on the product, like always making it better, solving a problem, filling in the white space, telling a really good story mm -hmm. is super important. And for me, customer relations, you know, like a lot of my businesses, Marquee Jet's a great example, was built on referrals, you know, getting people to want to help me. Start with the insight behind Marquee Jet's. Well, again, it checks all the boxes I just said. I was a passenger on a private jet at 28 years old. It was like when I walked into that airplane, it was like the scene in The Wizard of Oz when everything goes from black and white to color. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, people in, live like this? Like, yeah. what yeah. is this? It's pretty nutty. And I'm like, I want to fly like this. You're like, how do I do it? And it took us down a, a research path which said like, well, I'm not going to buy my own airplane. It's $20 million, you know? I'm writing jingles at the time. Um, <laughs> to, I'm not going to buy a fraction of a plane because I'm not going to make a commitment for five years and put millions of dollars down. And, no way. I'm like, take four trips a year. And I don't want to charter because that option is like, who's flying the plane? And there's inconsistencies on all that. So we came up with this hybrid idea called Marquee Jet, where we would fly on the best planes in the world, net jets owned by Warren Buffett, and offer people no commitment just $25 increments, like a debit card, you prepay. 25 hours could cost 100 grand or 200 grand, depending on the size of the airplane. You fly two hours, you have 23 hours left. And we took a meeting with NetJets, and after four or five meetings and pitches, we were able to get this deal, and we ended up becoming bigger than them. And as far as you know, customers, we had 4,000 customers. We did $5 billion in cumulative sales. That business has probably done more like, I'm gonna guess maybe 15 billion in sales since we started it today. But it checked the box. White space, solved the problem, et cetera. And what was the customer service piece that you were about to mention? So what I was saying is back then I had no sophisticated way to get leads. There was no internet. I had to show up where wealthy people were and pitch them basically or befriend them. When I got my first customer, my first customer, if I remember correctly, I had two real first customers. One was a guy named Josh Koppelman who just sold his company, Half.com, to eBay. And I met him at a conference in a coffee shop where I ambushed all the muffins. I took it. And anyway, I over-serviced him and he gave me a referral. And I was like, wow, that was so much easier to get a referral from him than me having to fly 3,000 miles to go to a conference and you know basically fluke into a sale. And then... The, when he gave me a referral and I signed them up, I serviced the heck out of him. I did everything you and I would do, but I did so much more. If they were going to Mexico, he would get a list of babysitters and emergency contacts and I would make reservations at restaurants and like, there was no way he could leave this program. I was too valuable. I made myself <laughs> irreplaceable. Right. And they gave me referrals and I continued to do that until we built it up. How do you decide where to steer your energy next? It seems as if your problem, well, your problem and your opportunity of being Jesse Itzler is not just that you have these amazing ideas. It's you've got a pick of all the ones that you have to decide where to channel your energy. You know, Paul, there are days where I say to myself, I just going to shut it all down and be with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> there are, man. Right. Little, I had that debate, I would say once a quarter mm -hmm. where I'm like, why am I even doing any of this? I could just train for five hours a day when my kids are in school and then play with them for five hours right. and date my wife at night. And that's a great life. And then I say to myself, I'm 52. If I project out five, 10, 15 years, which I like to do, my life looks a lot different in, in five years. My parents are 91. Are they going to be alive in five years? I hope so, but I don't know. My kids are going to be you know, almost out of the house in five years. I try to go to where the ball's going. And this is the sweet spot for me. 
52 is where I have most of my relationships. I'm yeah. still relevant. Like once you get 60, 70, you become less relevant. It's just a fact of life. You know, Joe Montana is less relevant today than he was, you know, now there's Mahomes and all the new guys and Michael Jordan gets replaced by Curry. And, you know, it's just like, it's this cycle. And I feel like my window is short. I got to be honest, man, it's short. So I'm in attack mode right now while I have that window of, you know, five to eight years. And that's how I look at it. So how do I choose what I want to do? It's where my passion is. It's where I think the biggest opportunity is. But it's really like what I enjoy to do. And I never get excited about the end number. I'm selling calendars right now. Right. You know how many calendars you have to sell? You got to sell like <laughs> like 10 million, like one out of every 30 Americans has to buy my calendar right. versus like a thousand people buy a jet card. Right. You, you know, 30 million people have to lock in at 39.99. Are there still Hallmark stores at the mall? I don't know. There, but that's what I'm saying. I mean, like one of the things that's always blown me away about you is that you do all these crazy things that in the end turn out to be amazing ideas like Hell on the Hill and Everesting. Talk about what Everesting is. Yeah. And- so that touches into my passion for endurance sports. But we started a company, my partner, Mark Hodelik and I, called 29029, where we rent a mountain. <laughs> it- <laughs> The whole mountain. From Hertz? We take it over. I don't see that. Enterprise. 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 Oh, right. That's funny. And they gave us a better deal than Hertz. They'll pick you up. Yep. We rent the whole mountain. You hike up the mountain. You take a gondola down and you repeat until you climb the equivalent of Mount Everest. And we bring in bands and food and it's amazing. And we- How long does it take most people to climb 29,000? Oh my God. With the gondola time down, 30 hours. Oh my gosh. Took me twenty nine hours the last one. So two very long days or two very three days. long days. Right. Yeah. But the reason why we started it was again, it goes back to like, how do you choose these things or whatever and white space? I was frustrated with the options in the category. I don't want to do obstacle course racing. I'm not a good cyclist. I don't like jump I don't like swimming and getting kicked in the face. And this is something <laughs> that anyone can do, man. You can hike up a mountain. Yeah. Uh, but you still feel like you've pushed yourself to Iron Man plus limits. Yeah. Because you've hustled, worked hard, and taken risks, and gotten lucky, you've made 99% plus money that almost everybody in the world would consider to be a lot of money. If you could tell 14-year-old Jesse something you know now about money, what would it be? Oh, man. Well, I got two powerful lessons about money. The first one was I was about 14 years old and I was at a Carvel store that my mother took me to after a Little League game getting ice cream to celebrate whatever, two scoops of chocolate mint ice cream Mm -hmm. every Tuesday after Little League. She gave me money to run to the Carvel store when I, I got my change and I was running back to the car and I dropped a penny and I kept going. And a woman stopped me, grabbed me by the arm picked up the penny, handed it to me and said, do you know how hard your mom and dad work for that penny? And that was 38 years ago. 38 years ago that happened. And I remember it crystal clear. I literally remember my uniform, the cleats, everything. That stuck with me, man, about like not blowing money. I've still blown money. But the importance of that, of like how hard you work to earn something, that was a really powerful lesson. The other powerful lesson, I forgot. <laughs> that is the powerful lesson. Wow, that lesson. was powerful, man. That was big. Yeah, but it's true. It's like, I went through a period of guilt. Like, I remember going to college and thinking about joining the military, ROTC, mm-hmm. because I was like, my parents are spending all this money for me to go to school. Right. And I'm like, I'm an idiot, man. I'm drinking. I'm going out at night. I'm not going to every class. My priorities on this investment are not aligned with the people that are paying for yeah. this investment. And I felt guilty. I felt guilty last week. I was in Puerto Rico. And that's like a therapy session for me. Let it out. I'm in Puerto Rico and I'm running. This never happens to me. I'm running, rarely. I'm running and on this beautiful resort, the Dorado in Puerto Rico, gated, ridiculous community. And as I'm running into my ridiculous apartment that we have for the week, there's about 15 people in the hot sun planting little shrubs and stuff on the driveway, the workers that work at the thing. And I was like, felt bad, man. I was like, I can't believe that I'm 
going for a run in my Hoka sneakers, my beautiful shorts, my high tech running shirt into this amazing apartment that I have for the week. And these guys are out here all day working for probably a small wage, sure. doing landscaping that's really irrelevant to the scheme of, you know, it's just like, it just got me thinking, man. So how do you use your good fortune to create the world that you want to see? I think about how I can have the biggest impact. So, you know, my wife, I guess me through association is in the giving pledge. So she's giving- right at least half of her wealth away, which could be up to 90, you know, up to all of it, but at least a minimum of half. By design, I'm part of that. I'm not part of the pledge because I don't have the wealth my wife has. <laughs> but by association, <laughs> I'm committed. Because okay. it's all in the same kitty. Sure, it's yeah. all in the same kitty. But thinking about how I could have the most impact, and that's not just through money. It's through like environment. Even today, I was on a run and a plastic bag blew down the hill on Pineland. And I went and I grabbed it and it was important to me to throw it out. And I actually had thoughts when I grabbed this about this just ending up in Nancy Creek, yeah. like ending up in Nancy Creek or something. And like, right. you know, so impact to me, it's weird, Paul. I don't know, like all of a sudden I'm having these thoughts and they're not like crazy guilt, but they're definitely, I won't use the word guilt. It's part appreciation because I'm super beyond appreciative and grateful and part like, I wish everybody could experience this not have to worry about that. Like I'm going through that in a big way right now in my life. Well, one of the things, and this is a question actually I've written down, so I'm not just improving this. I improv so little. I should improv more. Anyway, one of the things I've noticed hanging around you for- Oh, I remember the other story. <laughs> okay, They both on. happened when I was young. All right. From when I was six years old, I wanted an Evil Knievel remote control motorcycle. It was a wind up motorcycle. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Everybody had them and I didn't have an evil Knievel. And I begged my parents, you know, and I finally got this evil Knievel motorcycle that I've been begging for months. And they, you know, they probably a decision that they had to make. Should we get them? And I just remember like two days later, I was so bored of it. I was like, this is such a lame toy. Like I did it three times. It was like a lesson in just like, you know, you have all these things. And one more money story, last yeah. one. This was the most impactful of my life. I had saved up allowance for weeks and there was a song called Turn the Beat Around, I think by Vicky Sue Robinson in the 70s. And I loved it. We bought a record player in my house. We had a record player. And I told my mom, I want to go and spend my allowance and I wanted to go buy Vicky Sue Robinson's Turn the Beat Around. The 45. The 45. Mm -hmm. We went in there. They were out of the 45. It was sold out, but you could buy the album. Oh, the that was album, like $6. $8. Yeah. It was $8. The single was a buck. Right. And I bought my entire allowance to buy this album. And I listened to the song Turn the Beat Around like 5,000 times till the needle ruined the record. And all the other songs sucked. <laughs> And I was like, I can't believe I just spent my entire allowance instead of having the patience yeah. to wait one uh -huh. week and get the single. These are low impact lessons. Low impact, high memory. Yes. If I sing the high impact, low cost is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> For five bucks, you could have saved yourself incredible amounts of money in the long run because you realized that the music industry was ripping people off. I haven't outgrown it. This is the moral of the whole thing. The, the irony is like, Shame on me because I learned that lesson at six. If I go in now and there's a car that I want and the color is, you know, I got to pay more because like they're not going to have it in stock, but I want it. I'll be like, well, what's the shipping cost to overnight the car? And whatever number they say, I'm like, I'll take it. I feel the same way. It's like, get what you want. Immediately. We'll wait to make sure that you want what you want, but when it's time to purchase, get it the way you want it so you don't sit there and look at that nice thing you spent 98% of money on. And if you would have spent 2% right. more, you would have had it the way you wanted exactly. it. Exactly. All right. Let's talk about BYLR, Build Your Life Resume. Crazy Money is available on Build Your Life Resume Radio. Why did you start Build Your Life Resume and what are you hoping to impart to the people who participate? Well, I have a coaching program called Build Your Life Resume. I want something for the community, but I just felt like there was, again, a void in radio has changed a lot since we were kids. And now everything is being streamed and this and that. And I thought there was an opportunity to create a one-stop for podcasts, for music, for DJ mixes and other stuff we're going to add on where it's like, instead of me having to go to like Spotify and the Apple store and podcast list, I could curate on one app, 
a place where you could get all of those things. And it's a work in progress, but we're live. We stream 24 hours worldwide, playing the music that I like, playing the podcast that I love, and just really changing the narrative. So, you know, it's part inspiration, part podcast, part music, and I'm loving it. It's a lot of fun. And I want to hear the music I want to hear. I want to hear the voices that I want to hear. I want to share the news that brings positive vibes into my life as opposed to all the news that finds us in social media and ruins our day, regardless of what side of the aisle you might find yourself on. So it's a cool experiment. You know, one thing I never did was I never had a plan around how much money it's going to make or a business plan or my thing was it's going to cost X. Let's just get enough to cover the nut on it. And that's that. You mentioned on your Build Your Life resume site that your strengths are optimism, endurance, good vibes, relationships, finisher, and party starter. (laughs) What are areas of your life that you need to work on? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I do research for these interviews, you know. Can you text that to me? Those are great words. I know those are my words. They're on my little resume thing, but I need that front and center. That's amazing. I would say are the opposite of all those things. (laughs) Patience. These are aspirational strengths. Right. <laughs> Patience is probably a weakness. Right. I don't know if I'm a great listener. I got to become a better listener. I'm all over the place. I try to be super present, but it's it's always, I'm a work in progress. We all are. We all are. When you're all over the place, the solution to that, friends, listeners, is an eight foot by 20 foot whiteboard in your home <laughs> office. That's how you get clarity. Party starter is a phenomenon. I'm going to put that on my business card. All right. One last question. Party starter. When your kids are older, 25 years from now, what do you want them to think about their dad? Well, first of all, I'll be 77. And they say that the greatest indicator of success is if your older kids still want to hang out with you. So I hope that when I'm 77, my kids still want to hang out with me the way that I want to hang out with my parents. I just think that the same way I feel about my dad, man, that I show up for everything as it relates to them. Because I do have a lot going on, but we both go to the swim meets, we go to the baseball games, we go to all the events, we practice, we hang out on the driveway. I know you're an amazing dad. I try to be as good a dad as I can be. And that's all really you could do. There's no like legacy for me, like, oh, my dad did this or built this. or It's just all about like, my wife and I both invest a lot in our family trips in, we just bought an RV to do more of that. No, but like to really creating experiences. And, and I didn't see it in your driveway. I know. I well, I, I moved it. I moved it. I don't want that to be the focal point of this conversation. Sure the neighbors would love it. Oh, Christ. Disler's got an RV parked out front. Believe me. <laughs> Add that to their list. <laughs> yeah. So you just want your kids to hang out with you. I mean, when I'm 77, I want them to still want to be around me. Yeah. And, and still, I want to be able to still provide advice the best I can. And if you said to me, what'd you like the most? I just launched a new product. This week has been a busy week. What was my favorite thing? My kid's basketball practice. Right. Without question. And I think this year of all years, having missed spring sports and here in Georgia, we're lucky our kids get to play sports. This fall baseball season was the best baseball season my son has had. And I enjoyed it more than any other season ever. Even more than like you playing. Oh, who cares about me playing? It's I mean, so like, great. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. My dad died a couple months ago and he died in a recliner surrounded by his kids. And it was sad, but I was like, that's, that's how I want to go out. hundred percent, man. 100%. My older kids, my older kids, not my younger kids. I want to go out with my 50 year old kids. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's right. Jesse, where can people find out more about you? I'm just on Instagram at Jesse Itzler, Twitter. Website, same thing, at jesseitzler.com. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of fun, man. Thanks. That was fun. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Good to get one of our fun conversations on the record. Folks, if you're not listening to this on the BYLR radio app, BYLR, Build Your Life Resume radio app, see a link to it in the show notes. Click on it. See what Jesse has curated for you. 24-hour, all-in, funness, and good times. Also, if you want to check out the Big Ass Calendar Club, there are links to that in the show notes, and you can follow him. Sounds like my dad. Hey, follow uh, follow me over there. You can follow him on Instagram also, at Jesse Itzler. Link to that in the show notes. As there are to the Crazy Money listeners Facebook group, 
There's a link to it down below, or just go to Facebook. You know how to get there and search for, I almost said Google, you don't Google in Facebook, but you search for Crazy Money Listeners and you'll find your way there. Request to be admitted and you will be. Let's talk about takeaways, shall we? Number one takeaway. Here's something I found interesting that Jesse, when he was trying to pursue his dream, he had this passion and the way he made money work for himself while pursuing his dream was not to try to make extra money, but to spend as little as he possibly could. By reducing his burn rate to almost nothing, he made things possible in his life that he could not have made possible otherwise. And I think that's a great lesson, not only for us grown up people who are deep into our careers, that we should define wealth relative to how little we can live on, to how little we need, rather than to how much we can accumulate. I think that's good. But also, for the next generation of adults coming out of college right now, perhaps, or you know, early in their career, and they're thinking, I couldn't possibly live on less than, fill in the number, $60,000, $80,000, $40,000 per year. So I have to take whatever job pays me that much money. And that's just a great way to paint yourself into a professional corner way too early in life. So if you've got a person in your life, a kid, a nephew, a neighbor, who's sitting there thinking that they have to do whatever job because they've got to spend a certain amount of money, they have to have a certain kind of car, maybe offer them some contrarian advice. Maybe reduce your burn for a little while and see what you can accomplish in a non-traditional career path by pursuing that route, period. There, thank you. Uh, Number two, plan to get the most out of your year. It's New Year's, you got a lot of time left. But start now. Start by planning. It's not a coincidence that Jesse gets as much done as he does each calendar year because he prioritizes and plans. Like I said, he's one of the most purposeful people I know. As I mentioned before, there are links below to his big-ass calendar in the show notes. But whether you use his calendar or your own, make a list of the things that you really want to get out of 2021 and start there. Make a list of the people you want to spend time with in 2021. Make a list of the people you want to talk to by phone, if not in person, once a month, and put a time on the calendar to call them. Make a list of the times you're going to have date night with your spouse, and when you're going to spend that time with your parents or other family members who you won't have in your life forever. It's all about planning. Number three, also interesting relative to number one here, that the things Jesse pursued in life that are the things he's most proud of, the training, the 100-mile races, the entrepreneurship, they were never about the money. He pursued things out of an abiding passion to get the most out of life. And that's been his key to success. That's his unique thing. And I think that you know people can tell the difference between whether you're after the buck or whether you're in something for the passion. Like Simon Sinek, the author, not spelled C-Y-N-I-C, S-I-N-E-K, He says that charisma comes from a clarity of why, why you do something and being clear on that leads to you exuding charisma. People want to follow people who are motivated by the right reasons. If you're in it for the dough, people can smell it like poopy on your breath. But if you're in it for the mission, people will follow. I think Jesse's proven that with his success. Anyway, hey, uh, thanks for sticking with us all the way to the end. I'm so happy we're here together at the beginning of 2021. I can't wait to see what you accomplish this year, what we can accomplish here on this here podcast. Again, I'm grateful to you for being a part of it. Thank you to editor and producer Mike Carano. Wouldn't have started without him. And Mike Carano, please, please, sir, please make me sound smart.